Hello and welcome to the IT Security Fundamentals Start With Your Weak Points webinar presented by Don Jones. I'm Miles Wilson from TrainSignal and I'd like to take a minute to tell you what to expect in the next hour. I'd like to draw your attention to the questions box in your webinar control panel. Don will be answering questions today, so please feel free to submit your questions during the presentation. Also, if you have any technical difficulties, let us know in the questions box and we'll do our best to assist you. Today's presentation will be recorded and available to view on our blog. We'll email, email you the link after the presentation. After you exit the webinar, you'll be prompted to take a short survey. TrainSignal wants to hear from you, so please take a few minutes to complete the survey. We'll also be choosing one participant from today's audience to receive a copy of TrainSignal's Security Fundamentals by Don Jones. To be eligible to win, you must complete the survey that you will receive after the webinar. Be sure to fill it out as it only takes a few seconds. Also, if you have any additional comments or feedback, you can email us at webinars at trainsignal.com. And with that, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Now, here's Don. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Choose the greeting that is appropriate for your time zone and welcome to Security Fundamentals. Start with your weak point. Let's jump right in. Um, we're going to be reviewing some of the, I guess, what you would call the key components of modern IT security. Uh, if you're joining us for the live webcast, please join the conversation by submitting questions or even if you have an observation or something from your own experience that you'd like to share, drop that right into the questions box. There's no need to wait until the end of the webinar. I'll be happy to take your questions as we go. We're going to be focusing on three particular areas for this presentation. The first is how attackers typically go about attacking some of the key services on your network, the role of social engineering and helping make those attacks happen, and some of the key resources that you'll really want to focus on protecting. A quick bit about myself before we go on. Uh, as Miles said, my name is Don Jones. I'm a Microsoft MVP and VMware vExpert award recipient. My job is a senior partner and principal technologist at Concentrated Technology, which is a boutique IT uh, sort of a consulting slash education firm. I've written more than 50 IT related books and I'm currently a columnist for both Microsoft TechNet Magazine and the independent Redmond Magazine, which covers the Microsoft space. So let's jump right in. How attackers attack. One of the, I guess, most generic forms of attack, one of the, the types of attack that can be used to attack almost any public facing service is the DDoS or distributed denial of service attack. And this is really just a, I guess, a brute force sort of attack. The idea is that the attacker attempts to overwhelm a service by overloading it with bogus traffic. So uh, in the case of a web server, for example, an attacker might send a bunch of requests off to the web server, forcing the web server to process those, but then they drop the connection. They don't really care about getting the response back. They have their computer just turn around and create another request and another request. Uh, if you can imagine, going to a box office to pick up tickets for a movie, and instead of a nice orderly line that everybody waits in, everybody's allowed just to sort of rush right up to the window and start screaming what they want. Well, the ticket taker quickly becomes overwhelmed, and no one is actually able to get to the service legitimately as a result. So that's really what a, a distributed denial of service is all about. It's become increasingly popular for attackers, mainly because it's so effective. It's really, really difficult to defend against this type of attack, and it's something that can be used, as I said, for almost anything that is connected to the public internet. There, there are a couple of ways that people go about at least mitigating the effect of a distributed denial of service. Uh, probably the most straightforward one is to have a smart border. So here at the top of this diagram, we've got the cloud with all the evil attackers coming in, and rather than allowing them to connect directly to our web server, we're forcing them to go through a firewall or a proxy server of some kind. Most modern firewalls and proxy servers that are designed for this kind of use are designed to detect the distributed denial of service. In other words, they're designed to recognize the patterns that accompany a DDoS attack. And rather than passing all of those requests through to the web server, the firewall is smart enough to just drop those connections. So ideally, what that allows you to do is allow your legitimate requests to still get through to the web server while dropping some of the, the let's call them illegitimate ones, the actual attacking requests. Now, this is not perfect. An attacker who's 
firing enough traffic at this firewall can easily overwhelm the firewall itself. Uh, and so, you know, you sort of have to build more of them. Maybe you have two firewall machines or three or four so they can take on more of that traffic. And I guess that really takes us to, uh, it takes us to 201 of uh, DDoS prevention, which is more distributed services. The more services you have, the more servers you have, uh, the harder it is for someone to overwhelm them all, right? If, if one server is capable of, of taking on, I don't know, 2,000 requests a second, then two servers can take on 4,000, and it becomes that much more difficult for an attacker to do that. And it's not just a matter of building out a, a web farm, which is kind of what this illustrates, several different servers serving up the same content. Another trick you can use to help prevent a DDoS attacker, again, mitigate it, is to have those servers geographically distributed as well. It makes it a little bit tougher for an attacker to get to every single one of them simultaneously because all those packets have to take so many different routes to get there. Um, when you start talking about things like Amazon Web Services or uh, Windows Azure or any of these sort of cloud computing things, they have so much scale and so much capacity on the back end that they're often able to be more resistant to a DDoS attack simply because they're so massively distributed. Oops. Now, there's another approach that you can sort of use, uh, and that is an intrusion detection system or an intrusion prevention system, an IDS or an IPS. Uh, these capabilities are some of the ones that are often built into a firewall or a proxy server these days, and they're designed to, again, recognize the patterns of specific types of attacks, including a distributed denial of service. And they can help take preventative measures. They can start dropping the traffic faster so that your services aren't overwhelmed. Uh, sometimes you may have a response where they actually take a server offline briefly so that it can recover from attacks and come back up more quickly and start servicing legitimate requests rather than, say, crashing. Uh, sometimes rotating IP addresses can help. If you know that all of your incoming attacks are being fired at a particular IP address, telling the server to stop responding to that one and to instead start responding to a backup address can sometimes help. And there's other steps, you know, based on very specific bits of the situation. Uh, and, and again, many of the smart borders, firewalls, proxy servers, have some of these capabilities built into them, depending on exactly what product you're using. Now, aside from that sort of generic brute force distributed denial of service, attackers also rely very heavily on vulnerabilities in software. That's what attackers are really attacking. If they want to take your web server down and a distributed denial of service isn't a, a, an option for them, they don't have the capability or it's just not getting what they want, they're going to go after the software and they're going to try and get to the specific vulnerabilities of your software. One thing that a lot of companies will do, for example, is spend some effort trying to disguise what web server software they're actually using on their web servers. Uh, and it's not just web servers, it might be email servers, it, it might be any public facing service, because if an attacker doesn't know what software you're using, it becomes a lot more difficult for them to figure out what vulnerabilities that software might have. Now, once they are able to figure out what kind of software you're running, it's not that difficult to go look up a set of vulnerabilities. In fact, our vendors, our software vendors, companies like Microsoft, actually make that very easy for them because Microsoft publishes a list of patches that they've issued for their software. So all an attacker has to do is go look at what patches have been issued recently, kind of roll the dice and hope that you maybe haven't kept your software patched and up to date, and therefore you still have the vulnerability that those patches would address. And so one of the most important things you can do as a security fundamental is protect your software. Patch your software to fix those discovered vulnerabilities. And it is important that you apply those patches as soon after they're released as possible. Otherwise, the very existence of the patch tells an attacker what to attack. And of course, uh, another great option and another really key security fundamental is to simply remove software that is not being used on your server, that removes it as a potential vulnerability, something called reducing your attack surface. Um, this is something that's, that's been a, a situation, especially in the Microsoft world, for a long, long, long time. Back in, in Windows 2000, for example, 
Internet Information Services, Microsoft Web Server, was pre-installed and enabled by default on all Windows 2000 computers, even workstations. And so once there was a vulnerability in that software and it became well known, attackers had a free-for-all. There were several different viruses and attacks that were deployed that way. So what Microsoft and a lot of other vendors have started to do, and, and you see this now as, as we start moving into Windows Server 2008 and now the, the soon-to-be-released Windows Server 2012, is when you get a computer, much of its functionality is turned off or not even installed by default, especially on server operating systems. You have to go in and particularly pick out the bits that you want the server to do, and everything else stays disabled. That way you have fewer vulnerabilities out of the box. Now, social engineering is another way that attackers can try and, and attack your network. The, the idea behind social engineering is that rather than directly attacking the software or the hardware, they attack your users. They convince people to help an attacker get what they want. Uh, this might involve getting people to install malware on their computers, to reveal passwords or account numbers or other sensitive information and so on. Phishing and farming are two examples of how social engineering can be automated by computers and something we'll talk about in just a moment. This business of installing malware is actually yeah, we have really, a question. Really crucial for, oh yeah, yeah, jump right in, Miles. Uh, we have a, someone asking this, um, what are the signs of a DDoS attack and how would you know you're being attacked? Oh yeah, that's a great one. So, you know, if you're looking at, at a distributed denial of service attack, um, where you've got a bunch of, of, of traffic coming in, there's a couple of signs. It, unfortunately, typically, when these things launch, you're not going to know that it's happening until it is happening. Uh, when someone launches a DDoS against you, it's not like they start with one connection and then another couple come in and another couple come in. They don't ramp up. It's all of a sudden you go from functioning normally to having 60 bazillion requests pounding on your computer it, it, and literally it, it can happen in a microsecond. So you're not going to see it coming. Once it starts happening, if you're monitoring your servers, uh, it's very easy to see the number of connections, incoming requests and so forth start shooting through the roof. And once you see that spike and it stays sustained for a few seconds, then it's good odds you are being hit by a DDoS. Um, from there, there's not much you can do to mitigate it except shut down hope that the attacker sees that you're no longer accepting any requests and that they give up. Um, it's a very, very difficult type of attack to prevent against. And, you know, I'll tell you, this gets back to the social engineering. One of the ways that attackers launch a DDoS is by getting people to install malware on their computers. So let's talk about something real quick. The difference between a denial of service attack and a distributed denial of service attack. A denial of service attack is pretty straightforward. One guy with one computer attempting to overwhelm your computer. Now that's difficult to do. It's difficult for one computer to produce enough traffic to overwhelm a high-end piece of server hardware. And so you don't really see actual denial of service attacks anymore. Instead, attackers will get malware spread as far and wide as possible, creating something called a botnet or a robot net. That's where that comes from. And that gives them tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of computers that they can enlist to all try and gang up on another server in a distributed denial of service. So a real key for a DDoS attack is the attacker's ability to enlist hundreds, tens of thousands of computers if possible. And malware is the way they do that. So the more we can all be responsible about protecting our systems from malware, the more we can all prevent DDoSs from happening to anyone. Unfortunately, even though we all have antivirus software and anti-malware software, social engineering is a great way to convince people to install malware that maybe our antivirus software wouldn't catch. Here's a perfect example. Uh, this, is, this is sort of a, a worst case scenario, but this is a picture of Microsoft Internet Explorer uh, on which someone has installed uh, three bazillion different toolbars. Now, not all toolbars are bad. You know, you can see some of the, the ones on the top here. There's the Google toolbar and the Yahoo toolbar, and, and those are fine. They provide a very useful service, and, and a lot of people find them to be very helpful. 
but there are definitely toolbar software and add-ins for IE out there that while they may provide some useful function to a user, and that's how you convince the user to install them is by alleging that you know this will be helpful and useful and it'll show you deals and things like that all day long. Behind the scenes, that software could well be waiting for incoming instructions from its masters ready to enlist your computer and a botnet and start taking part in distributed denial of service attacks or any number of other types of attacks. So malware isn't always necessarily a virus. Sometimes it's a, well, it's a loosely legitimate piece of software that you can convince someone, and there's the social engineering piece of it, you can convince someone to install because they see some value in what they see on the screen. They don't necessarily realize what's going on behind the scenes. So browser toolbars have, have been one of the most often used and successful social engineering vectors. Uh, you get a, a seemingly useful toolbar or a minimally useful toolbar, and in reality, you're just using it to give your attacker a jumping off point. This is also how attackers get inside the network. Right? Uh, attackers don't necessarily always want to pound on your public facing services, your web server, your email server. Sometimes they want to get inside the wall. They want to get inside the office network. And these little toolbar browsers and, and things like that, those seemingly innocent pieces of software are often a launching point to get the attacker inside the organization. And it's one of the reasons that IT people hate, hate all of those little add-ins so much. Um, because it's really tough to tell until something goes wrong if you've got one that's legitimate or one that's potentially, you know, not so legitimate. Now, phishing is a, a fairly well-known form of attack these days, and it's about mocking up a website that looks like a real one, say, creating a Bank of America website of your own, and using that to collect passwords, usernames, account numbers, and much more. This attack relies on users being a little bit gullible and a little bit technically ignorant. In other words, they, they just don't know that these things are possible and they don't think to check for the little telltale signs that would tell them they're being scammed. The main cure for phishing is not technology. There's not a lot of things you can put into place to stop this. The main cure is education, helping users realize that this is going on and, and giving them some, some education about what cues to look for. Some technology tools can assist in that education. Uh, what you're looking at right now is a phishing website. This is not a legitimate website. Uh, you'll notice if you look at the top that the URL is microsoft-bs.com. Uh, this is a mocked up website that is supposed to look like the real Microsoft Advertising Ad Center. Uh, and the idea is someone gets you to type in your username and your password and then they know your username and your password. They can go to the real site and start using that against you. They'll also rely on the fact that a lot of users will use the same username and password across many different websites. So once they get your username and password here, they'll go and try the same thing on your Gmail account, on your eBay account, on your PayPal account, and you can see how they can start to really get into more dangerous things a lot more easily that way. Now there's a couple of ways that you can protect against that. Um, this screenshot is showing one way that Internet Explorer helps to do that. Um, and it uses a, a, a blacklist, a list of known unsafe websites. And when you try to go to one, it will stop you with this screen and say, hey, this website has been reported to us as being unsafe. So we don't want you to go there. We recommend that you not go there. Even up in the, the browser's address bar there, you can see there's a big red highlight, a big red X that says unsafe website. As many visual cues as possible are being given to the user to help them become smarter about this. But IE is not stopping you from getting there, but it's going to make you maybe think about it again before you, you go all the way through with it. Hey, Don, we got another this question sort of from the, the audience. Oh, yeah, yeah, jump right in. Um, the question is, is there a feature like this in other web browsers? What if an organization uses multiple different web browsers? And is there a way to centrally manage this for all of them? Yeah, um, unfortunately, there isn't. Uh, different web browsers definitely implement this type of feature in a lot of different ways. Um, Firefox uses something similar to this, Google Chrome uses something similar, but they all maintain their own blacklists. Uh, there is a certain amount of sharing that goes on between them, but 
probably within an organization, the right thing to do is rather than relying on each individual web browser protecting your users, you have all your users going out through a firewall or a proxy server already to get to the internet. So that can become a choke point. And a, a probably a better approach is to manage this block list on the firewall. So rather than the browser needing to worry about what sites are unsafe, the firewall can subscribe to a centralized list and just stop everybody from even going there at all. In fact, <coughs> excuse me. In fact, you might even not give them the option to go through. In other words, rather than warning them and saying, hey, this might be unsafe, think about it before you go through. You can have your firewall just say, I'm not letting you get there. If you think you really need to get to this site and you think it's really legitimate, contact the IT department and they'll take a look at it for you and see if we've made a mistake. But for now, you're blocked. This approach, uh, what you're looking at right now, is something that is a little bit more industry standard. You're looking at a couple of web browsers here, uh, both of which are pointed at PayPal.com. PayPal uses a new type of of security certificate. You'll notice that both of these web browsers are pointed to an HTTPS address, meaning they are using um, the SSL or TLS encryption, so the web server has a certificate. Something a lot of people don't realize is that HTTPS is not just about encrypting the data to protect it. There's really two, two purposes to HTTPS. One of those is encryption, but the other is authentication. In other words, when I'm hitting PayPal.com, that certificate proves to me that this website is owned by PayPal Inc. Now, because PayPal is a fairly high stakes thing, they've done something, uh, they're using something called an extended verification certificate or an EV certificate. That type of certificate is what triggers the browser to display this green address bar, green for good. It's what tells the, the browser to not only show the website address, but also the name of the company, PayPal Inc., uh, in the U.S. It's what allows the browser, when you, you click here, so you can see in the Firefox, which is the, the browser that's in the forefront of the screenshot, uh, I've clicked on PayPal's business name, and I've gotten this little pop-up that says, you are connected to PayPal.com. This is run by PayPal Inc. They're in San Jose, California, and their identity has been verified by VeriSign Inc. And your connection is encrypted to prevent people from stealing your information. So these, these EV or extended verification certificates cost more money. PayPal has to pay more for those. They can cost up to $1,000 a year, I believe. But it does create this, this better set of visual cues for trust. If you went to a, let's say you misspelled PayPal.com, you, you missed one of the A's and you hit enter, and somebody had registered that website, and they had put up something that looks like the real PayPal, you would not see this green address bar. And if your users can be educated to look for visual cues like that, then it helps protect them from phishing and other types of scams. Tell them, look, if you're going to a website and you're going to be entering you know, confidential information like usernames and so forth, look for the green address bar. If you don't see the green address bar, be suspicious spend more time investigating. That's not to say that the lack of a green address bar automatically means you're on a scam website, but it means you are going to have to take more, more caution, more care, more steps to verify that you are where you think you are before you start providing that private information. Hey, Don, we have another question. Hey. Yeah. Um, are there any differences uh, between different browsers with the green and the red and the X's? Um, on the, yeah. Yeah, with the red, yeah, not every browser does that. But with this green, this is an industry standard. Um, so unless you're on a, an old browser, uh, I'm not sure that Internet Explorer 6, for example, would do this, but anything newer would. Any, any browser made within the past five or six years will follow this, this extended verification. Now, how they visually present that to you will be a little bit different. You'll notice that IE in the background here turns the entire address green, whereas Firefox, which is in the foreground, um, just has this little sort of green button next to the address. So the visual presentation will be a little different, but they will all use the color green. They will all display the company name in addition to the website address you're getting to, and they will all allow you to click on the company name 
to get some sort of pop-up that tells you what the website is, who the company is, and so forth. So this, the green business is standardized. The red, uh, this here, this is not standardized, although my experience has been that most of the browser makers are doing something substantially similar to this in their visual presentation. Uh, so Firefox's would look a little bit different from this, but not so different that you wouldn't know what was going on when you saw it. One more question, Don. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a question that says, if any website shows the HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash, does that mean it's a, a, using a secure certificate? Uh, it does. It means they are using a certificate. However, here's the difference between a normal certificate and one of these EV certificates. Any certificate can provide you with encryption. But, you know, think about encryption. Um, if you're handing encrypted data to an attacker, it doesn't really matter if it was encrypted or not. No other attackers will be able to drop on the conversation. But what's important in any secure conversation is that you know who you're giving the data to. And on the internet, that can be difficult. I mean, you're just connecting to a website. You have no idea where that's physically located. You have no idea who actually owns it. So a normal SSL certificate doesn't require a super high degree of verification. In other words, if I go to a company like GoDaddy or VeriSign or, or whoever else and I say, hey, I want to buy a certificate, they might charge me 50 bucks for that for the year. And they're not going to do much more than verify that I can receive email at that same domain name. So I could still be kind of a malicious bad person and get an SSL certificate. These EV certificates, the ones that create this green reaction in the browser, they're a little different. One of the reasons they cost so much is that in order to get one, the, the company that's issuing you the certificate, GoDaddy, VeriSign, or whoever, they have to do a really deep background check to make sure that you really do work for that company. It is pretty much impossible for you to get an EV certificate saying you're Microsoft or PayPal or eBay unless you really are that company. And so that's why these EV certificates trigger these extra visual cues. Now, in most browsers, um, just because you are connected to HTTPS does not mean you will get all this green stuff popping up. There's kind of two levels of HTTPS. There's encrypted, but the person you're connecting to might not really be the person they say they are. And then there's the EV, encrypted, and they are definitely who they say they are. So we're going to turn everything green so that you'll feel good about it. And all of those visual things are really cues for education. Education is the only way to truly prevent social engineering attacks. You've got to have smarter users. And you've got to think about the ways that your users might be fooled. And you've got to, unfortunately, you know, being in the IT industry now is not just about being technically smart. You also have to be a good communicator and a good educator because you've got to find ways to simply and concisely communicate to your users to help them understand how they're being attacked and help them understand what tools are available for them to verify what they're doing so that they can avoid an attack. Stopping social engineering uh, is really difficult. It's harder than stopping a distributed denial of service attack. Users tend to trust technologies that they're familiar with, and it takes a very, very strong, continuous, and deliberate education effort to make your users a little bit paranoid about those things. Uh, and, and you know, it's, it's kind of like the old national security level. It's difficult to keep your users paranoid and cautious all the time because we, we get lazy. And, and we get distracted, you know? I mean, we're, we're just trying to do our jobs. We're sitting here, we're going to the internet. We're not thinking constantly about people trying to attack us. Uh, you know, it's like anybody who has an alarm system in their house. How often do you really set that thing? Do you, do you just tend to set it at nighttime before you go to bed? Are you really good about setting it every single time you walk out of the house? I mean, every single time, even if you're just running down to the corner store for some milk and and the house is going to be empty, but, you know, gosh, it's only going to be empty for 10 minutes. I don't need to set the alarm for that. That's, that's just how we are as people, and, and it can be really difficult for us to maintain a high level of paranoia. And unfortunately, that's, 
exactly where social engineering steps in. This is a, a great example of social engineering. This is a screenshot from an iPhone. And <clears throat> one of the most common forms of social attack right now are these, these short message services, these SMS text messages that go out. And the idea is they get you to, to click on a phone number or, or send an email or go to a website or whatever else. And as soon as that happens, understand that the way these guys are attacking you is really, really simplistic. It is so cheap for them to send out these text messages. Uh, it, it costs something like a thousandth of a penny to send out a text message. So for, for a penny, for one penny, you can send out a thousand of these things. They're willing to spend a hundred bucks and send out tens of thousands of these. So they literally just send them to every possible phone number. And, and they don't know if any of them are going to be successful until you call or click. And the minute you call or click, a couple things happen. They immediately know that they've hit a valid phone number and they're going to sell that to other attackers and you're going to start getting a lot more of these things. And they will use that contact to try to get some personal information out of you. And, and that's what social engineering is all about. And you know, until fairly recently, gosh, I want to say maybe it's maybe it's six months or so that, that I've started getting these things. Um, until recently when that started happening, we trusted our text messages. They only came from our friends or for services that we specifically opted into. We, we weren't getting them just randomly. And so when people started getting these things, they thought, well, I don't know, I, I must have opted into this. I, I've never gotten one of these out of the clear blue sky before, so, so it must be legitimate, so I'll go ahead and click through. Um, you know, and now some folks get, get dozens of these a day because they made the mistake of replying, or they even if they replied with stop, thinking that that's gonna opt me out of it, uh, that just tells them that you've got a legitimate number there and you're going to start getting more of them. So these, these social attacks can be very devious and very cleverly built. Uh, and they, they, they rely on our weaknesses. They rely on our innate trust of things Quick question, that we Don. understand. Yeah. Um, is there a way to stop these SMS attacks? It seems like our audience is getting these all the time. Yeah. I, Miles, have you gotten one of these things? It seems like everybody has at this point. I definitely have. Yeah, yeah. So um, you can stop them. Um, turn off your cell phone forever, unfortunately. Uh, in other words, there's no practical way of stopping them because these folks are, are literally just spamming every possible phone number. I, I think the carriers are eventually going to have to do something about this. They're, they're going to have to to give us the ability to block these things except from numbers that we allow or, or, or something. I don't know how they'll, they'll implement it, but right now, no. There is there is no way to just lock these things. And that is part of what makes them so insidious. Uh, here's another one. Uh, as you can see, these are not limited to just English. I wanted to make sure everybody knew these happen in all kinds of different languages. And about the worst thing you can do is poke one of those links because as soon as you go through to that website, uh, you are gotten. Or as soon as you go through to that phone number, they, they know they've hit a real phone number at that point. All of this leads us to one of the reasons why social engineering can be so effective. It, it allows attackers to bypass many of our more traditional defenses. Most networks are built with an implicit level of trust for our own users. We, we have to, right? Our users are there to do a job and, and we trust them to do their job. So we tend to protect primarily against external threats. And unfortunately, our ability to protect against external threats is very, very good. The technologies out there today for intrusion detection and for firewalling and everything else are very, very effective. You know, the, the movie scene where somebody sits down and hacks a firewall in five minutes, this doesn't happen. These are really strong pieces of software and we've made it so difficult for attackers to get in from the outside that now they need to get in from the inside. And so they will use social engineering to convince our users to do something our users shouldn't do, such as installing software, getting usernames, getting passwords, getting account numbers, whatever else. And that gives them an in to our internal network. Once they're in, attackers typically encounter very few defenses and very little resistance. So hey Dan, this is the, the typical network these days. At the bottom, you've got the cloud, that's the internet. We allow people to go out there only via a firewall, and our office network has got a great, 
big, solid, concrete wall around it. We don't let anybody in unless we know who they are. Unfortunately, once someone is in, there's almost nothing to stop them. They can go from computer to computer to computer and do pretty much anything they want to do. So what we've got to do is start building layered defenses. While we still have to trust our users, we also have to recognize that sometimes they might do something stupid. And we have to mitigate their ability to create or to become a launching point for an attack. And that means firewalling the inside of our network as well. Restricting users so that they can physically only get to the resources that they need and they can't even see or touch or find out about. Hey, Don, we got another resources. question. Yeah, shoot. Um, why don't ISPs or other industry watchdogs notice and receive, uh, receive these texts and then shut them down from sending to people? Oh, back to the text messages. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, so far, nobody does. Uh, I, I, they certainly should. I, I, it looks at this point like it may take government regulation. Um, there's really not much stopping them from doing it. You know, I mean, how many text messages do you send to one of your friends? You, you might send a message to five, six, maybe 10 people at a time, and that's it. Okay, anybody sending 3,000 messages at a time is clearly a spammer and should be blocked, but they don't do it. Um, I'm not sure what it's going to take to make them do it. It's certainly technically possible. It's really more of a political issue. Maybe, maybe not enough customers have complained and, and asked for refunds and stuff. Uh, so it hasn't become a business issue for them. Uh, so, so sort of getting back to a this quick idea question of, to uh, go along oh, with that yeah. one. No, go right ahead. Um, does adding does adding your phone number to the federal do not call list help with this? Does adding your number to the do not call list help? No. Um, I, my impression is that folks who are sending out messages like this one are not terribly worried about the Federal Communications Commission. Um, at, at at best, at worst, putting your number on that list tells them that they've got a legitimate phone number and it gives them something to attack. You know, that whole do not call list is only as effective as the punishment and so far there haven't really been any punishments. Um, I think most people really regard that list as a, as a, a kind of total failure uh, because there's no real enforced penalty. Um, no one's been punished for not obeying that list, unfortunately. So this idea of, of breaking apart the network is, is part of an overall security fundamental tactic called defense in depth. You obviously have to have a certain amount of trust in your own users because they do have to get their job done. But you don't have to completely trust them. And you don't have to completely trust that their systems won't become compromised. The idea of defense in depth is to build multiple layers of defense, including layers that protect against the spread of internal attacks. You can't prevent internal attacks all the time. It's going to happen. Some machine on your network is going to get infected and it's going to become the jumping off point. But you can mitigate and limit how far that attack can go. And that's really the goal of defense in depth. So our last Quick bit, question on defense and depth, Don. Oh, yeah. Um, doesn't this make the overall network more expensive to build and maintain? Oh, absolutely. Um, firewalling off bits of your network makes it harder to operate your network. Uh, it's, it's more components, right? I mean, these, these things aren't free. You have to pay for these capabilities. Uh, you have to pay to manage those capabilities because you've got humans who've got to do that. Yeah, it absolutely makes your network more expensive to build, to operate, to maintain. And you sort of have to create a trade-off. You have to decide, what's it going to cost me to deal with the outcome of an attack versus what does it cost me to put these measures in place? It's really an insurance policy. Uh, you know, none of us are excited about buying car insurance, but in most cases, we have to do it. And if your car gets totaled in an accident, the total cost of your car insurance is probably less than the total cost of the damage and the injuries and everything else. And that's why we buy it. Uh, insurance makes our lives more expensive to build and maintain, but if something bad goes wrong, then it's worth it in the end. And that's really all this defense in depth is. It's an insurance policy, and it does make things more complicated to build and maintain, but if something goes wrong, then the cost can be worth it. So you just have to work out what those costs are. 
so that you can work out what the correct amount of, of paranoia and the correct amount of defense in depth is for your organization. Uh, One more question on defense in depth. Yeah. Um, will the communication on the network slow down when you have the multiple layers on the defense in depth? Will the network slow down? No, not really. Um, the, the way you engineer these things, uh, typically, I mean, I, I guess it, it could be slowed down, but we're talking, we're talking nanoseconds, if not less. Um, even additive over massive amounts of traffic, it's, it's not something you're going to notice. These components are, are built to do this. Um, you already have components in your network that have to move data back and forth. We're simply proposing um, enhancing those or replacing them with intelligent systems that can look at the traffic as well as limit where traffic can go. Um, so it, it's really kind of the same structure, just smarter. And, and to, to get to this point here, whether or not it slows things down kind of is determined by what you choose to protect. So you do have to focus on your key areas. Public facing services, mail servers, web servers, and so forth, obviously a major attack point. It is absolutely mandatory that you put some protections around those. Also, internally, any significant data repository, your database servers, your file servers, and so forth, must be protected both from external attack, but also from an internally originating attack that you might not expect, um, something coming from one of your user machines due to a piece of malware. And the right thing to do, both from a performance and a cost standpoint, is to assign a risk level to each major asset. You know, if this particular database is compromised, it's inconvenient, but not a big deal. This database, on the other hand, this other one, has got all of our secret customer information and account numbers. If that was compromised, it would be the end of life as we know it. The earth would stop spinning. We would all fall off. That's a higher risk asset. And so you design specific levels of protection for those different risk levels. Uh, and that way you can sort of focus your resources, focus your, your money, obviously, focus your performance, tuning, and everything else to keep things moving smoothly. You do have to protect against specific types of attacks. DDoS primarily focuses on public-facing assets. Uh, so you can worry about that with regard to those. Any major or complex piece of software that you run is a potential attack point. Attackers will seek to exploit known vulnerabilities. So you've got to keep your software patched. Running outdated or unsupported software is a massive security risk and possibly the most common entry point for attackers. And you know what, I'll, I'll make a little prediction here. We've got about 800 days on the clock for Windows XP before Microsoft just gives up on it completely. Right now it's an extended support and they're really only providing patches for major security issues. But that's going to stop. Those patches will stop coming, and it's not going to be that much further in the future. I will guarantee you there will be organizations out there that continue to run Windows XP past that date. They will be running outdated, unsupported software. Someone is going to discover a security vulnerability in Windows XP after that point, and they are going to exploit it, and those organizations are going to steal the pain. And you know, it's one of those, I don't want to run around screaming, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, but it's going to happen. And that is the biggest single cost and risk of continuing to run such an old operating system for which the vendor is no longer providing support. Now, there's one last thing I want to discuss here, and, and this is sort of the, the concern that IT departments have about the consumerization of IT or the consumerization of technology. This is a major reason why companies get concerned when users begin utilizing external public services, uh, say using Dropbox instead of an IT provided web server to share files with the public or, or with particular customers. That external service might not provide the same levels of protection as our internal services and that's why we get concerned about it. We don't want our users using something that's, that's less secure. On the other hand, sometimes those external services might provide better protection since those public services have to be engineered to vastly greater scale. You know, if, if your organization has a web server where you, uh, maybe it's a public facing SharePoint server and you only allow your partners and vendors to get in there and that's how you share information with them. It is not very challenging for an attacker to overwhelm a single server. 
it would be very difficult for them to overwhelm all of Dropbox because that's hundreds of servers spread out all over the world. So sometimes, you know, although there is obviously concern that, and you have to take the entire picture into account, don't immediately write off external services as being unsuitable for security reasons because sometimes they might offer a security advantage. You really do have to look at the whole picture. It's worth looking at whatever the solution might be rather than just rejecting it out of hand because sometimes you might pick up a security advantage. Now it's almost time for your questions, so I hope you're, you're typing those in. Um, we've talked about how attackers attack. They, they can do things like a generic distributed denial of service. They can come after specific pieces of software vulnerability. They use social engineering to get inside your network and attack from there where they can effectively bypass most of our traditional defenses. And we talked about identifying the key resources, the things that would be the most attractive to an attacker and the things that you therefore need to wrap a little bit more around in the way of defenses. So, uh, Miles is ready to, to take your questions. Please keep those coming. Uh, Miles, I'll, I'll turn things over to you uh, for any questions we do have, and then uh, when we hit the end, you can wrap us up. Sure, we have a couple questions from earlier in the presentation. Um, one would be, would you agree that users should be made aware, then trained, and then educated on social engineering? It seems there's currently some good traction for awareness programs, but they don't regularly continue forward and move upwards. Yeah, I'm a big advocate for that. And uh, this is going to sound horrible, but I'm also a big advocate for doing white hat testing from a social engineering perspective. In other words, think about some ways that your users might be socially attacked and attack them. Do it yourself. Because awareness is one thing. Uh, even training is one thing. But, you know, there are so many priorities in a corporate environment. There's so many messages hitting users all the time. Until they really experience it, they're never really going to internalize it and embrace it. You know, the example I always give people is, I'm sure a lot of you listening have got children. And I'm sure you've had to tell your kids, hey, don't touch that hot pot when, when mommy or daddy is cooking. Don't, don't touch what's on the stove there. And probably most of your kids touched it at one point anyway. And it wasn't until they touched it and thought, oh, my God, that hurts. That was the moment where they internalized it and they thought, I am never going to touch that pot again. That's just how our brains learn. We learn from experiences and we learn from making mistakes. And so one thing I'm a big advocate of is help your users make that social engineering mistake in as safe a way as possible. Uh, trick them. And, and you have to do it in a way that's respectful, obviously, and you have to do it with the support of your organization's management team. But, but trick them, not so that you can point at them and laugh. You, you do that later at the bar. But so that you can say, this is what happens. This is how they get you. This is exactly what it's going to feel like. And here's what went wrong. Here's the damage. Once they've experienced it, it's a little bit easier to, to cut back on the training and the awareness raising because it'll be internalized at that point. All right, we have another question from earlier in the presentation. If a site called paypl.com pretends to be PayPal, isn't that fraud? Why are they not closed down and prosecuted? It's frustrating to keep the same obvious fake messages all the time. Yeah, it is. Um, I, you know, I, there's two sides there. It, it, it is fraud. Um, a lot of times they're operated outside the U.S. So the U.S. government's ability to get to them is extremely limited. Uh, and even PayPal's ability to go after them for, you know, trademark infringement or whatever else can be very, very limited. Um, it's, it's a big globe that we live on, and not everybody has to operate under our laws. The other side of it is that this happens so often and so frequently, and these sites go up and down so fast that it frankly overwhelms the ability of, of our government to do anything about it. Um, they do try. You, you definitely read news stories where, where they've managed to you know, successfully take down some of the bigger offenders, but gosh, those, those guys turn around within 24 hours and they've got another site up. It's, it's just they move faster than we can. So I, I think we have to assume that we can't fix the problem. We have to mitigate the damage by helping, helping ourselves and helping our users learn to avoid those things. Um, technologies like extended verification certificates were created in large part because it provides a very visual cue that you've gotten to the right place. And 
we just have to start becoming accustomed to those because the attackers are always going to be out in front of us on this one. All right, looks like we have two more questions. Um, regarding consumerization, would it make sense to request all of our providers and their supply chains be SSAE 16 certified? It would make sense. Um, uh, maybe not that particular certification. It kind of depends on what industry you're in. You know, folks in the financial industry, for example, in the U.S. have a specific set of standards they have to comply with. But, but the broader answer is absolutely. Um, and I would say not only your existing suppliers and, and, and vendors and supply chain, but go out to some of the more popular ones that could potentially be suppliers and say, look, we're not doing business with you today, uh, but if you ever hope to do business with us, here's the standard you have to meet. Here's the certification you have to meet. Uh, that's got to be externally audited and verified. And if you can do that, come back and let us know, and, and we'll sort of put you on the short list uh, so that if a user need comes along, and we can't immediately fulfill it within the IT department, we at least have a list of vendors that, that we know could fulfill that. Uh, and then we'll look at whether or not we want them to do that over the long term or whether we're going to use that vendor as a stock. If you start making business decisions at that point, but yeah, absolutely. Standards are a, a fantastic thing, and you should definitely press your vendors to, to look into them. All right, we have another one here. I'm in a large healthcare environment of approximately 13,000 users. Many of our users are blocked from installing software, but too many still have the ability to download and install things from the internet. How big of a risk is this for the organization? Uh, it's a massive risk. Um, unless your users are smart enough to know what's good and what's bad, and, and frankly, even super smart IT people like us have, have a tough time figuring that out sometimes, uh, it's extremely dangerous. You, you sort of have to weigh you know, on the one side, ideally, we'd like to completely lock down our machines so that that type of thing would be impossible. And there's any number of, of awesome, legitimate, good reasons to lock things down. On the other side of the equation, the more we lock things down, the more we risk preventing our users from getting their jobs done. And so sometimes you just have to find that middle ground and cross your fingers and hope for the best and have a good mitigation plan in place for when things go wrong. Um, it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it's where we are with computers right now. Um, I think things are getting better. They've, they've certainly, I mean, gosh, I've been doing this for almost 20 years, and, and things have certainly gotten better than when I started out. Things are a lot more manageable now, and, and any of you who have been in the industry for more than a couple of years, I'm sure you've seen the same things. We do get finer grained control and more centralized control, and that'll continue going forward. Um, but then there will be new types of attacks for us to confront, too. So. You know, you, you kind of have to do both sides. Protect as much as you can. Make sure that your users can still get their jobs done. Otherwise, they will turn away from you, and they will find a way to do their jobs in an even less secure fashion. Um, but also have a mitigation plan in place. You know, most companies have a disaster recovery plan. Very few have a malware infection plan. We, we know what to do if a meteor hits the building or if the power goes out, but we don't know what to do if we get a virus. And, and we should. We should have a plan for that. What do you start shutting off to prevent the spread of that thing? What do you what do you immediately start locking down and protecting? Get that plan in place. It's going to happen to you. We can't stop it. We can try really hard, but we have to assume it's going to happen and have a plan in place. All right, we have two more questions and then we'll be done. Um, I heard that we really don't need to use a high-end firewall because it can be easily penetrated by Black Hat users using HTTPS. What's your opinion on that? Um, I, it kind of depends on what you mean by high-end, but I tend to advocate a defense in-depth approach. So the nice thing about a high-end firewall is it, is it gives you a lot of flexibility as to what you'll allow in and out. However, flexibility comes from complexity. So it's a more complex piece of software. More complex means more moving parts, means more room for bugs, means more vulnerabilities that, like you said, could be attacked. So I actually uh, tend to recommend that my customers build uh, use both. Start on the outside with a very simple, stupid, brute force firewall that is just designed to block unwanted traffic. And then behind it, a more intelligent firewall. So the first one kind of protects the second one, and the second one protects the rest of your network. Um, kind of depends a little bit on, you know, exactly what level of attack you want to be able to survive, but defense in depth, layers of defense, not just one defense, is always the right way to go. Uh, the more layers you have, 
the harder time an attacker has of getting through them all. All right, last question of the day. What do you think of the SANS 20 critical security controls for the effective cyber defense? A good technical concept? Uh, yeah, it's a good technical concept, and there's there's several out there uh, that are like that. SANS is, is really well known for their security work. Um, they're vendor neutral, which is nice. You can take those concepts and apply them to almost any kind of software. Uh, so, yeah, you know, if, if your organization or industry doesn't have something that would supersede that, you know, legally or, or with industry rules, um, then that's a, a great starting point for, for security. All right, that's all the time we have today. Thanks again for attending and for your, all your participation. As a reminder, today's webinar was recorded and will be available to view at trainsignal.com forward slash blog forward slash webinars. We will also email you the link. And remember, as you leave, pl please fill out the survey for a chance to win a copy of Train Signal's Security Fundamentals training. We will email the winner by the end of the week. Thanks again and have a great day.